So this is the same layout, or the same file, but you can see that I've put in the parameters Sydney this time. And I've got a do it through Sydney. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I'll uh, back to here. So this is on the phone. Stick that down there. So I've got the do it button on the phone. Can you see the parameters you've got Sydney at the top there? The very last one, time zone equals Sydney. Okay? Very top. So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this on the phone. There we go. So it's got the got the answer. I'll printify it. Where is the answer? In the there, down at saving time false. We've got Australia Sydney. So we've got Australia Sydney. Tuesday at 10 the UTC time is 10.01.52. It's a lot slower on the phone now, isn't it? Oh yeah, well it was, yes. Well it, the phone is actually talking to the machine, mm -hmm. but it's doing, because I'm using the machine as the, um, as, as the host, so you've got two things there. Um, let me just go, let me change that to um, Adelaide. And I'll hit the do it button again. It's saying, bring it back, there it is. We're now in Adelaide. So it all works natively on iOS. I'll have a, I'll, I'll go into the, uh, uh, into the script in just a moment, but uh, that one doesn't work. That's what about places that have got um, two words like New York? It's probably New plus York. I'll try it. I'll try it on the phone. No valid time zone on that one. Mm -hmm. So let me put school. Uh, let me just put a space in. It might be no spaces, no valid time zone. I don't know what the uh, what the nomenclature is, and that's Hong that, Kong. It's part of the thing of knowing what, the, what yeah. you're supposed to actually put in the, the syntax of, of whatever it is. Um, I'm putting together a registration type system for one of my clients and I thought, ah, we need the iOS, we can use this. So what I've, what I've done is I've set up a FileMaker database on my server and I've set up a very simple web page and I've got this talking to the web page, the web page talks to the FileMaker server, the FileMaker server talks, gives the result back to the web page and the web page gives it back to me. Okay. So what I'm sending across is a user ID, I'm sending across the persistent ID of this device, so I know that it's this device, I'm sending across a registration key and I'm sending across what device type it is. Now it says here that this is Go because it's been left in from the last time I did it on the phone. But when I run this, it's going to do it from this one because it's slightly different. I'm sending these across as curl data. So it's sending it across as post data. So it's going to the website as a post, does some PHP talking to FileMaker, comes back, does it all of that. So let's see how that works. Do it. Validated. Okay. That quick enough? I'll just go back to uh, back to that one. Device validated. How did you figure that one out? It's <laughs> really quite easy. <laughs> um, what I'll do is I'll show you the uh, I'll show you that particular database. Uh, 
Uh, no, sorry, wrong one. Very simple database on this end. I've sent across one one five zero two six. Is one five zero two six? Okay. Why hasn't that worked? That should have a key in there. Said it was validated. Okay. I'll try that again. <coughs> ah, there we go. That's better. Device validated. It's come back in the dialog box. I think I accidentally switch, switched layouts. There it is. Quick enough? Okay, let's see what happens on the iOS device. Um, so, different device, different persistent ID. I've got the same key in there, so I'm going to Validate. Device validated. When you said the same key. There it is. Is that quick enough? I've got the same key. I've, I've, I've created a registration key and I've hard coded that, that into this particular thing. What if two people pretend to be the same? How do you stop? Okay, so I've validated this device now. So I'm going to validate again says this device is already validated. Oh, sorry. This device is already validated. Okay. So I'm going to take those both of those validations out and do it again. Back to here. We're done. Okay, so I don't have any registrations at all. I'll come back to this device. I'm going to validate. I think that's reasonably quick. Yeah, yeah. So that's talked. It's it's still using this as the host, and you would have that on the, in on the device. It's talking to my server at at Killsite. Yeah. It's talking to the FileMaker server, talking back to the thing, coming back to here. That's pretty well instant. Good internet here. <laughs> okay, so I've validated that device. I'll do it again. And it's telling me that device is already validated. Come back to the desktop. So if I come into, uh, where is it? That's devices. So I've got one device there. Come to my users. That device has come in there. It says it's on go. It says it's registered. Come back into a laptop and I do it. Almost as soon as the finger comes up. Battery out. <laughs> that's that's validated. Refresh the portal. We've got both of them there. Now, if somebody comes in, depending on your rules, if somebody, if I wanted to make this so that you've got five licenses, you can have a, a go and a pro for each of those. Then you could come in and you could have, fill up that portal. And when it gets to too many oh, devices, that's no. it. You can't do any more. So if somebody, the other thing that I've, I'm doing with this as protection is that if somebody took that registered one, gave it to somebody else, different persistent ID, as soon as they open it, persistent ID is different, sorry, you're not registered on this. And if they've got a new machine, it can then go in and this is, you've already got one of those um, registered, do you want to delete it and put this one on? So I deregister that one and re-register this one. So that thing would, must run every time they want to use that? Program. When it first, well, it's, the very first time it does it, you validate, and it says, yes, this device is registered with this persistent ID. So somebody, every time it opens... If they give it to somebody else, though... But give it to somebody else when the... When, so the opening script says, is this device registered it's in the with this... Script, yes. In the opening script. Is this device registered with this persistent ID? Yes. Okay, go on. No, it's a different persistent ID that's been registered. Pops up a thing that says... This device has been registered to somebody else. Yeah. Do you want to revalidate it? And then it would go and talk to the server. So it's all on device until you actually have to do it. But the way this is working at the moment, there's no need to do that. Assuming you've got an internet connection. 
Um, so just very briefly, just see if I can very quickly So the, the PHP to get that to run isn't very much. Okay, it's just it's creating a connection, so it's finding it. Uh, if it's found it, it does something and it sends some things back, and I just send these things back as a JSON message. So whatever happens, whether it's an error, whether it's a, a thing, it just gets sent back as a JSON message, and then we'll have a quick look at the script as it comes back. Yeah. Script. It's not the script. The thing is script. Um, that's a different one. Yes, yeah, so what we're doing here is we're getting, we're using the, the new JSON get element. So let's go back to something that's got some, oops, sorry, something that's got some things. Uh, let's go, let's put Melbourne back in here. So that one had obviously had to go to America and back again. Okay, so we've got we've got our result here, and if I pull up my data viewer, I'll just do it again so it's not prettified. And I'll come into my expression. So I can't remember all of these new things, so I type in JSON, and I get my, all my new JSON things. So we can delete an element, we can format an element, we can get an element, we can list the keys, the values, and we can set an element. Setting and deleting is creating JSON objects to send somewhere. So you can set all of them up to send somewhere. We'll just have a very quick look at the things that we're getting back. Um, so let's format, and we will format, because I've dropped that into the result, there it is, so that's formatted what you can see there, so we can see things nicely. Okay, so let's uh, leave that there. And we'll get an element. Uh, let's just list the keys actually. We're going to list the keys of the same thing. Now we have to tell it what we're actually listing. Uh, the, the, a blank gives us all of them. So that's given us all of these keys. So this is a key value pair. So here are all the keys. So if you set it up, and this is what I've done with, with a client today, is I've set up a table so that the, the, um, the field names match the keys. So I've just got a loop. So grab you the keys, walk through the, the loop, with each key and put the value into that field. Just set field by name with the table name and the element, the, the key. Uh, makes it very quick, very easy. So there's our there's all of our keys. We can also get a list of the values. Spell. There's all of our values. So you can see there's all the values in there. So if you wanted to get a list of the values, you could. What's more useful is to is a JSON get element. So we're getting it from the result, and we're getting uh, what was one called? Um, times place timestamp. So there's our timestamp element. So that's, that's actually a Unix timestamp. I've done a lot with that today. So I could get, do get as t 
time stamp. That now this isn't going to work. Oh. Not quite. Why? Because the Unix epoch is different to the FileMaker's epoch. Oh, yeah. Unix, Unix start date is the first of the first 1970. Yeah. FileMaker start zero. date, I think, is the first of the first zero. Zero. Yeah. Okay. So. You have to subtract or add. Yeah. What I've done today a lot. Where is it? seconds. It's 68,000, 68 billion seconds or something. Yeah. Um, what I do with those sorts of things is I create a custom function. I created a custom function called epoch. And epoch is that. So what I'm going to do is copy that custom function. How do you remember all the names of all your custom functions? Because I've named them um, as something that's sensible. That's why I have trouble. Yeah. They're great, but I forget what I call them. Yeah, I, for I forget that I've got them. Yeah, it's not. Too. It's not so much that I forget what I've named them. I forget what I forget that I've got them, and I go in to do it. And I'm, oh, I've got that. Gee, that was clever. <laughs> I'll try and work something out. Yeah. So I've now got. Uh, I'll actually. I'll put this uh, custom function in here. Manage custom functions. So this I've already done it, which I have. <laughs> so I've already put it into here. So I can now just say get as timestamp plus. plus Epoch. And then that's, that's now got the correct time. So if I wanted to find, um, I'll do the same thing. You see that I often concatenate things with a, a Pilpro, so I can see lists of things of what I'm doing, what I've got, what I want to get, and then I'm going to copy and paste into something. This is live, yeah. yeah. You don't have to say, Monitor or yeah, I, okay, so that's the other great thing about this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See how I've ticked the automatically evaluate? Yeah. So this is fantastic. It's spontaneous, isn't it? Fantastic, unless you're doing the execute SQL statement. <laughs> because some of those take ages, and you start typing it, and you sit there, and you watch spinning rainbows and spinning rainbows, and then it comes up, and you go, oh, yeah, that's right. Turn that off, write your statement, say evaluate, then go and have a cup of coffee, come back. And see if you've got the right result. But yes, you know, automatically evaluate means that it's evaluating as you're doing it. And that is really good. Uh, so let's take off that and put in another one. And we're going to put in time zone. Um, time zone? <coughs> question mark. It's telling me, telling me it's a question mark, so it's, I know. Uh, that's because, oh, that's because get us time zone stamp on text doesn't work very well. So we'll take that out. So I was trying to do get as timestamp Australia Melbourne. That would, something would be interesting. And I can undo. Look at this. Undo. Oh, wow. Undo. Get as number Melbourne Australia. It gives me no result. So that's better than having that. So, and I can undo that. So, every every undo. character it undoes. Yeah. So that's uh, time. So, I've got an extra bracket. So, get J, uh, Jason, get Ellen. That's that one. Um, so, you can get all of this back and then just have those in your scripts and do whatever you want to do with them. Uh, so I'll just briefly show you the script that I was that I was talking about, where we just loop through the. Um, it's this one here, and so this T that's for this. So within this script, so I've gone off and got time zone data. I've dropped, dropped all of that in, um, gone off and got it. Then I've grabbed the keys, and then I've just looped through the keys. 
So I've, I've grabbed each element. So it's get value out of the keys, the counter. So it's the first element, second element, third. Um, and then I've grabbed the value, get JSON element from the response with the element. And then if I've got it, I drop it into a field and I've set the field by name and it's all standard nomenclature. So I drop that in and I've dropped the value in. So it just goes through and drops those in. And it's all nice and quick and easy and native file maker and it'll run on an iOS device. So that was one of the big things with this one is that they use iPads with this solution. They use desktops and iPads. It means that this will now work with an iPad. This particular one goes off and gets airport data. It's all of the data about particular airports and things that happens in the airports. Then it goes off and gets the time zones for that airport, put all of that in, and that's got to happen on the fly on an iOS device, and it works. Amazing. Okay, so that's, that's one of the really, really big ones as far as I'm concerned, being able to go off and the APIs you can do just about anything. If you if you need some data about something from somewhere, you can get it. And it's to the point where now where you can upload photos to a particular site. The photos can do machine code looking at that. It can deliver back what it thinks that photo is about. You can then send that off to somewhere else to get that to speak, and it'll come back and it'll speak what, what that photo is of. I have seen a demo of that, I didn't bother setting up for tonight. <laughs> I apologise. <laughs> it can be done. Somebody over at DevCon, I'm sure, is doing that as we speak. Um, but there is there is all sorts of data that you can do. Um, I've got a client who eventually will get to where we can use this to talk to Airbnb's back end. So they've got a file maker database with which they've used to do all of their Airbnb bookings, and at the moment they're rekeying. But there is an API for Airbnb, so we'll be able to click a button, and it'll be able to go across, get their data, pull it in, put it into their records. Um, I've been using for quite a while um, the base elements plugin to talk to zero. I'm going to convert across to using native to be able to talk to zero. Zero's got a fabulous API at the back end, application programmer interface. Um, any you can think of, there'll be an API for it. Um, some of them you have to pay, some of them are free. Um, the airport data one that I'm looking at there is a paid thing, you pay to get in to get most of it. The time zone thing there is free for non-commercial use. If I'm not bundling it with somebody and selling it, that's all fine. But prior to this, you could use the perform script on server method, couldn't you? No, no. That's only running. Perform script on server is only running FileMaker scripts on the server. Yeah. You still have to get you it to go and talk the to that server. To yes, you could use a plugin. Yeah. Yes. That way you can get around not having a plugin on the iOS device. Yes, yeah. but you've still got to then go talk to the server, get the server to do the thing, get the server to then send back the thing. This, this could be. This is this, direct. Yeah. This could be on a. At the moment, I'm using this on a host, but it could be on a standalone. It can be just on device. Yes. You don't have to be talking to a host. So long as you've got an internet connection, it will talk. Oh, okay, you don't need a host. Yeah. yeah. So, so you can say a standalone I, file on a standalone file on a on a iOS device. Mm -hmm. Yes, you've got to have an internet connection, but you don't necessarily have to have a great internet connection, yeah. like to get a solid connection to FileMaker. Talk to FileMaker, get FileMaker server to do its thing, and then give you some stuff back. You saw how quick that was. That connection was to a website. That's the sort of thing it's going to be. So just magic. Um, so that's all of the, the JSON passing and the character encoding and the oh, the cryptographic in things. I'll just briefly show you. Um, I won't go into it much because it's, it's reasonably esoteric and if you need to use it, you can use it. Um, and you probably will need to use it at some stage. Uh, I didn't go into here. Um, and I'll just go into here. Um, what's that? What's the system? What's the system? 
Um, yeah, the persistent ID is just is the ID of the machine. It grabs an ID from the machine, which is unique to the machine. But it, but it actually changes. It only changes on iOS devices yes. when you delete FileMaker off it completely and reload it completely. Yeah. 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 And do a do a system update sometimes. Change. It shouldn't change with the system update. It does, has in the past. In the past, yeah. Fixed it fixed that, yeah. yeah. It was a bug in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, persistent ID, um, it, if you take FileMaker completely off an iOS device and reload it because it looks for something that is part of that loading system, you will get a new persistent ID. But if you delete the file and put the file back on, right. you'll still have the same yes, persistent ID. Tied to the application itself, isn't it? As well as in the device. Yeah, in the, in the iOS device, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's something because it because the iOS device is all sandboxed, when it loads on, it loads on with a certain parameters and that's what's used for the persistent ID. Mm -hmm. yeah. It also works yeah. on the desktop files as well. Or, or, uh, yes, yeah. Desktop yeah. Yeah. But desktop never changes. Yes. Yeah. Never. No, because it looks and stuff on the desktop. Um, some of the crypting things, uh, we've got crypt auth codes, crypt decrypts, um, base64, something that used to be in base elements uh, that wasn't in the main system was base64, certainly encoding RFC wasn't there. I'm not sure where the base64 encoding and decoding was, I can't remember. You can see the base elements has it. And that's now been um, duplicated with native encoding and decoding um, and different modalities of encoding and recoding. So the, um, that serial number that I've produced, um, I think uses the MD5 something or other, encrypting to do things. And so um, if you need to know that sort of thing, that cell with the help documents. But they're all new native to FileMaker. Um, we've been through that. Something that they, well, I've shown you what happens when you try and open up a file. Uh, I'll just uh, open remote again to the dev server. So you can see that it's not encrypted. We can get rid of that. Uh, I will. That actually, go connect. I'll just you, grab the contacts again. Do you ever use SSL? SSL? I haven't. Um, I don't, unless you've got data that's super sensitive or that you've got a server where people are going to try and be breaking in. Mm. I don't really see the need, of, need for it. The problem with SSL certificates is that they are specific to an IP address. So if you've got multiple domains on a, on a thing, you've got to have multiple IP addresses. They, you can get wildcards, um, they cost money, and personally I don't see the use. Um, haven't hit it yet. I'm sure there'll be a day. But if I had a medical database, I would be saying absolutely, have got a, to do it. A medical database, issues. so yeah. if I had patient information of some sort, yeah. um, yeah. and I'm doing that over the internet, I'd say yes, we've got to do this. Because that's uh, over the wire. It's all, it is all clear text. Yeah, yeah. and it's. I think this is set up much more for the states. Uh, mm -hmm. There's lots of sensitivity with sorts of things. Um, you can see that there's a big red unlocked warning you. So uh, did I put something on this? I did, didn't I? So it's saying that that's unlocked, and we get this big red lock up here saying, oh, "Scary." <laughs> Oh, oh, better fix this, better show you this. And you did ask about this before. I'm glad I brought this one up because it's reminded me. Uh, we'll go back to our, back to here. Let's see if we can get this open again. Okay, okay, okay. So we will close this and we will open up contacts. This is one of the starter files. Touch ID. Enter 
that's kind of got sticky fingers. It's not breathing well. Sweating too much. <coughs> there we go. Okay, so this is one of the starter files. It's got one record in it. Um, but because it's a starter file, it's gone to the iPhone layout. Okay, so that's all very nice. And if I go back to contacts, it goes immediately back to contacts. If I go to that contact, it goes immediately to those contacts. Not very iOS-like. So, let us go to that layout. And we'll go to the layout. And we'll go to the button. And we'll go to the script step. And we've got this animation, which is what you asked about before. So what do we want to do? Is there a room, actually? Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> so, Yeah, would you, would you hey, run? Run? Oh, you're right there. Right. Okay. Um, so the arrow was on the right, so we want to come in from, from the right. Sliding from the right. Okay. And then we'll go to the other layout. And the arrow is pointing that way, so we want to slide back that way. So we'll grab that, go to layout, it's very simple, slide in from the left. Go OK, go back to browse mode. I oh, can't see your screen. No, we can't see. Should have told me earlier. <laughs> uh, go, back to, go back to here. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Much more iOS like. Now, a couple of things you might notice. You may, may or may not notice. Have a look at the the navigation bar right at the top. Contact detail. Watch the word contact detail. Fades to contacts. It doesn't slide. That's in a navigation bar. So if we go across to back to the state, go back to the layer. I don't. I don't use navigation bars a lot, um, but on iOS devices they are very, very useful. Because um, there's an expectation that there's going to be something there Sorry. either the top or the bottom because they don't move. Mm -hmm. So and it's got a navigation bar at the top. It's got the navigation bar at the top, same width. And if we have a look again at what happens. Show us. If you just temporarily make that a normal header. Uh, to show slide. Okay. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. Um, see crossfades. It's an automatic crossfade as it slides. Yeah. So if I make top navigation just a header, it will look very peculiar. Um, I'll go back to one and do that as a header. You see it on the slide there? Okay, it looks a lot more peculiar. So I'll change that back again. Back to there, so we're back to how we were. So that works really well, um, and you've got a whole heap of different things. Just got to think really hard about the navigation and how it works. So if you if you have something coming in from that way and you're coming back, you want it to come back from the other way rather than coming in and then coming in again and then coming in again, unless that's where your navigation is. But you're basically telling your user where things are happening and where they're coming from and where they're going to. And, and the expectation is if if you've gone. You've brought something in from there, and then you want some more information, you brought it in, 
then when you go back to where you were, you're pushing that back out again in the slide again. Only on the iOS device. It's a pity it's not on the other one. On the yeah, it may or may not come. Yeah. You can see where FileMaker is moving, and that if I allude back to the copy and paste of value lists way back in, in the early days, that's where they're moving to, to be able to copy and paste anything, because it's all XML based. So you know what to do layouts, wouldn't it? Yep, they, they're moving there. Yes, all of that stuff. But yes, it would be really nice to copy and paste layouts between solutions. Yeah. But it, and it, in the guts of FileMaker, that's all it is. It is just XML. Yeah. Okay. Emails pop up. Um, go back and see if there's anything else. Otherwise, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, insert from device, um, the signature, of the iPad well, didn't work properly on this, so I won't show it, but um, the insert device, instead of opening up to a full page, sorry, insert from device having a signature, instead of opening up to a full page to put your signature in, it will open up just within the page, so you can put and have the context of what you're actually signing. So that's rather nice. And it's it's screen size dependent, so it's no point doing it on the iPhone because the iPhone's a small screen, so it's going to go to the full screen anyway. Um, new window I've done. Ah, yes, something else that we need to look at. And we'll go back to Safari. And we will attempt to go to Web Direct. Okay, so Web Direct looks as as with 15 looks exactly the same as Pro. Same colours, same layout. Uh, we'll go back to there. Oh, no, there we go. Oops. Go back to here. So it looks exactly the same. Um, I don't use WebDirect much, but it's quick, it's great. The problem with WebDirect up to now is when you print it, um, I'll just print in black and white and I will open it in preview. Printing straight out of the browser. It's um, not all that fantastic. Web Direct, you can now print to PDF. So what I'll do is we'll create a script. Let's say, ah. am I in Pro or Web Direct? I think Web Direct. <laughs> Getting a script doesn't work. So we'll go back to Pro, script. A new script. Just call it a new script. Uh, I've actually done this. So why don't I just print it first and see what it does? Let's just see what it does. Get rid of that. And we'll put a button in here. Would have been a single step, couldn't it? I will do a script so we can put some other things in it if necessary. <coughs> so that just brings up my dialog box. Cancel that. No error capture, no nothing. All right, so in um, WebDirect, 
it hasn't got a nice little round button, but it's still there. Oh, look at that. New as PDF. Okay, I'm going to change it to A4. Number of pages. I'm going to view it as PDF. Look at that. Can I that? So printing gets converted to PDF automatically. Yes. Yep. So you can save it as a PDF, or you can print a PDF that opens up in a new window. And there's my PDF, which looks just a tad better than the other one. Printing straight out of the browser. So we get all of that niceness. And that's not making any nice layouts or doing anything. So go to layout, print. It saves it as a PDF. And I think in the back end you can also email it. I'm not sure. No, not on WebDirect. You can on the server. Server also does that. You can do save to PDF on the server now. <coughs> so you can get all of those runs of multiple invoices happening on um, the server and emailed on the server. I presume you can print it straight out of the server as well, but you can certainly produce all of the PDFs on the server now. So that's a biggie for people who use WebDirect. You can now print off your invoices or print off your statements or do whatevers. Um, so that, that's great. At least it worked. Um, I'm not going to worry about all the AV player things. Um, you can't do a set allowed orientations on the iPad anymore. Now, we've talked about unique values and sort values. We've talked about the, all of the different um, JSON elements. So, um, so what did you say about orientation? Orientation on the, as, as a script set. Step, you can't set the orientation on an iOS device. They've got rid of it. Oh, yeah, because they, you don't need it anymore because of other things. You can you can just, uh, you can tell what the what the iPad is doing. There are functions within it to be able to get the orientation of the iPad. So you can do it all programmatically in the background, rather than having it. You can ask it what is it doing. So rather than telling the iPad yeah. to do something, you can ask the iPad what are you doing and react to that. Okay, but it's still the same thing. You're changing. The yeah, iPad. it's the yeah. 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 And speaking of things that are being deprecated, those that are those of you who that use runtimes, they are not that much longer for this world. Okay. Runtimes have been deprecated. All of the new features that are on, that are in 16 are not in the runtime. You can still do a runtime in 16, but none of the new features will work. But you can still produce a runtime. You can still, yes, you can still produce a runtime in 16, you can still produce a runtime in 15, but you can't use any of the new functions, including, I think, all of those curl functions, in a runtime. Well, that's been happening for a while where they don't, yeah. they don't introduce new features in the runtime. Yeah. I think the new features were in the last of the runtime, but they're certainly not in this, and they've made a point of saying that new features are not in runtimes. Um, it's a bit of a risky move, I think, on Spark to do that. Uh, well, this is what I've used. I haven't used it before, but a lot of people have used it. Well, the, everybody uses Spark Maker in a different way, but I'm just saying correct. that a fair population of developers out there, especially the older ones, who have made a living out of that. If they're that. going to do anything, they, I, this is just my opinion. I haven't heard anything about it. Just looking at the tea leaves, what, they, what FileMaker has done if, is produce a software development kit for iOS. So you can produce runtimes for iOS that are code signed, that are fair income iOS apps that you can put onto the App Store. If they're going to do anything, they will produce a software development kit for desktop. the Mac, for desktop. Mm -hmm. If they do anything. Now, the, 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 one of the issues with this, and I've had a, an email the other day um, uh, querying this, is that downloading runtimes and running runtimes gives you the, this is not a valid, this is not a good thing. You've got to right click and open because they're not code signed. Well, that's true. But one of the purposes of runtimes, they haven't affected me, but I've read a lot of disquiet, a lot of people are unhappy about 
not knowing where his primary was going to yep. is that they used the runtime to create demo versions of their files. Correct. So that people Stick don't it on the server. the primary, they can just try it accidentally. Yeah. That's one use of the runtime. Yes, but the runtimes are very limited. Well, they are. Yeah. But for a lot of people, they don't need all the extra features anyway. Anyway, so runtimes are going away. If I were a betting man, and I'm not, there is a possibility of having an SDK. The problem with an SDK is that it's really only Mac side, uh, and that they'll never go Android. So the SDK works very well. It's all code signed. It's all signed and sandboxed. The other thing which I haven't mentioned in this is that with the iOS SDK, they've made it so that plugin developers can be part of that. So plugins can go into an iOS device as part of a runtime, as part of the SDK. Um, so it opens up a, a lot of possibilities for those sorts of things. And mobile is where users are. And for people who are going to use runtimes, it, that's the direction they're going to go. You don't sell runtimes for desktops anymore, really. It, yes, there's demos. Yes, this is what you can do, but really, it's, um, people are going mobile. Um, where did I get to with that? Yeah, runtimes are, are going. Uh, there's the, I, I, the iOS SDK. Um, don't worry about any of those. External functions can now run as script steps, apparently. Yes, when plugin developers convert them. So it's not just they happen. Um, the plugin has got to be written so that an external can be called by a script. Yes. I haven't seen any of those yet. <clears throat> I don't use plugins. Um, try not to use plugins, but yes, that is happening. Um, I think that that will just about do it. We've got <coughs> 10 or so minutes if anybody's got some questions. Um, has anything changed with the FileMaker Cloud? The use of FileMaker Cloud as, as a means of connecting? Um, yes. FileMaker, from what I understand, FileMaker Cloud is basically a... Um, well, it's based on a virtual server and it is a full copy of FileMaker server sitting somewhere. There's now, now five data centres, one in Sydney, it's just moved to Sydney, just opened, uh, one in Singapore I think it is, one in Europe and two in America. So basically you choose your closest location. That's it. One of the problems with FileMaker server, no matter where it's hosted, is that you've got latency, and if you've got worldwide <coughs> people talking to it, it's going to be slow somewhere. And latency kills FileMaker. Um, FileMaker, I haven't used FileMaker Cloud. I've seen it demonstrated. Basically, it's a full copy of server. It does everything that server does. Um, you can buy the FileMaker Cloud license. You can buy different uh, special versions of FileMaker which only talk to FileMaker 16 or Cloud, um, which a couple of my clients discovered when they bought the wrong licenses, and it won't talk down and it won't talk to any to things that aren't on Cloud. Um, but it's a good way of getting in, a good way of having um, a, a server hosted somewhere. And you can fire the, the the way it's set up is you can you can fire it up, you can pay it for it for a couple of hours, you can close it down again, and you can have it forever. Um, there are demo versions you can have for a couple of three weeks or something, but you just, you've got to be very careful that you close it down again if you're not going to use it because it just turns over and it turns <coughs> over onto an hourly rate. Um, and some people have had sticker shock when they've got a bill. So just be very careful about that. How does the cost of it compare to having your own file like a server or using a hosting service? Um, I haven't really looked into the costing of it. I would think it would be a very good solution for somebody who doesn't want to have an in-house server. 
again, my personal opinion is if you've got a, a business with the number of FileMaker, five or more FileMaker users, you whack a server in that business, you don't have any problems with latency, you don't have internet connect connectivity problems. It's not just what, what the pipe is in, this, in the server room, it's what you've got in your premises. So if you're on AWS a one, and you're trying to talk to something that's got 100 megabit, it's not gonna work. So you want it to be in premises. Um, if you've got big pipes, it's great. If you want to be roaming all the time, it's great. And you want a server sitting somewhere, and you can't get in and out, that's, that's great. Um, hosting services are problematical because they've changed as of FileMaker 15. They changed the licensing rules. So you've got to have a dedicated server for every license. So my license, my hosting service is, won't, won't continue. It's stuck at 14. Um, and I can't, I can't move on because I have multiple. That's bad for you. Yeah, yeah, it's called my business model, but I wasn't making a huge amount of money on that anyway. Um, but it's, um, you've got to have a dedicated server for every license. And my server isn't, doesn't have enough power to have virtual servers. And you're basically buying a license anyway. So FileMaker Cloud has taken over all of that. Um, from what I understand, it's not just FileMaker doing the dirty on people like me. There are genuine security issues, um, which have been resolved with FileMaker Cloud and by making by isolating. Um, so I don't know of any dedicated hosting in Australia. I think there might be one person in Sydney. There is still some dedicated hosting being done in the states. But if I were, if a client came to me and said I want to have it hosted somewhere and it's got to be on FileMaker 16 because of the server features for FileMaker 16, I would say go and do cloud, particularly now that it's in Australia. Um, the only, the, the reason that you would want it on server for the server features is to get the print to PDF um, to get the printing to PDF. I think that's about it. Because everything else can be done client side. So that's, although I've been talking to a 16 server for, um, as, as a development server tonight, um, all of everything that I've done would have worked just as well with on a 14 server. The development server that you're using, is that as feature full as the previous version of the server? Do you still get to, yeah, or you've only got the one connection? Oh, yes, just one connection with three, three pro connections and one um, you get three pro connections. Always had three pro connections. So they can cut that one. No. no. Three pro connections um, and one connection. So it's one iOS device, one a web direct at a time. So you can go and test all your web direct stuff. You can shut that down. You can go and test all your iOS stuff, shut that down you know, on your phone or your iPad. You can have three pro connections all working at the same time. Um, but certainly you can't do any load balancing or see how it works with load or anything like that. Any other questions? Well, we'll finish. Right. Yeah.